I'm Rich Sainz, and you're listening to the Procurement Conversations Big Conversation. Join me as I talk to procurement leaders and industry specialists about the biggest issues facing our profession. Before we start today's episode, I have a small favour to ask. If you enjoy the show, please take a moment to rate and review us on your favourite podcast platform. This helps us to improve and more listeners to find us. And if you haven't already, consider subscribing so you get the latest episodes as soon as they're released. This week, we're looking at why procurement suffers from dodgy data, how it affects the function and what we can do to solve it. And I'm joined by Susan Walsh, the classification guru, and Natasha Brown, who's the procurement director at Harland & Wolf. So I guess first question is, why does procurement suffer from dodgy data? By the nature of the people that we are who come into procurement, I think, a lot of us come into procurement by accident. It's not necessarily planned. Um, we're people who aren't, although we're commercially aware, we're not necessarily data aware or data literate. And I think the newer generation coming through are becoming much more data literate. From my perspective, there's a lot that I know data-wise in terms of words, in terms of obligations, but it's taken the past few years to start looking at data across the life cycle of procurement. So right the way from when you do you get your first proposal, you start doing your negotiation strategy through to contract performance, contract closeout, and assessing actually, did you achieve what you set to achieve, set out to achieve um, throughout the life cycle, the delivery, what went wrong, what went right, how could you improve? And it's this whole concept of continuous improvement. And I think it's continuous improvement that is driven data into procurement that we probably didn't think about it until we started looking at that and we really need data in order to drive to identify the baseline and then drive those those improvements and constantly try and keep getting it better and understanding where we're going wrong where we're doing things well and people like Susan are so integral to all of that yeah, from my point of view, I think Natasha's pretty forward thinking when it comes to this, but a lot of people are intimidated by working in spreadsheets and doing this. Um, and then often there's a, a resource issue. Nobody has the time to do it because there's more important things. I met a guy a couple of months ago. He's spending 40 hours a month building his, cleaning his data so that he can report on what he needs to report on. Like that's a whole week in a month where he could be doing more strategic things, but he's having to do that. And then another side piece to all of this is getting investment to actually clean it and tidy it and maintain it. Absolutely. And one of the lessons I've learned is the need to have a team of data analysts. So people who love data, who understand data, but can actually present it in a way that generates questions that you can then discuss and move away from afterwards. Um, But use that data to inform decisions. The more you go into looking at the data, the more you start to question and say, well, why is that happening? Um, We looked at costs that were being incurred that could be avoided in one of my previous roles, Um, A classic example was the purchase of donuts. Well, actually, why do we need donuts? Well, actually, sometimes it incentivizes people. It encourages them to come to meetings where it's voluntary and it can help. But it's then, is that a cost you really need to incur? Is it one that you should have going on in perpetuity or one that should be on and as and when? Without having the data, you don't really know those sorts of things. Yeah, and often I see part classified data sets so they might focus on the top 80 percent of value and that is like only 20 percent of the actual data the bottom 80 percent is the donuts and the hidden things that you don't see you don't know that's where fraud can be hiding um i i I've just been actually at an AP Accounts Payable Association event and they were talking about fraud there and we were sharing some stories about um, it's not just um, like things that you would you would think, you know, like maybe donuts or a, 
a shirt here or there. There was one lady in the US who put a boob job on her her corporate card. You know, now, like, honestly, you wouldn't probably blink at that value because people buy software on their corporate cards. If you're not classifying it, it's just going to be another number and it's not going to mean anything. And then if that person's doing it, have they done it before? Have they been doing it for a long time? And are there others doing the same thing? The cheat is to get, you know, the top suppliers looking pristine and shiny and then then our data is, data is clean. But actually, hidden under the surface, there's a lot of stuff that needs looked at. And I think we talk a lot about that whole Pareto principle of 80% of your spend should be with your top 20 suppliers. But so often when I look at spend data, that doesn't happen that often anymore. And you have an incredibly long tail. It depends on the business you're working in. It's really understanding what is driving that and why do you need, I don't know, 50 suppliers to provide um, communications and marketing. Actually, can you consolidate that? Can you set parameters and ground rules while still keeping creativity and flair? I've worked in some very different industries within heavy industry and manufacturing. You're looking at very different segments and then you start looking at the breakdown of the supply chain and understanding the margin on margin but also the overheads and also how people are building their costs up. We talk a lot about parts creation, but it's also really important to understand that supply chain nowadays in the context of net zero and all your carbon reporting, understanding it in the context of modern slavery reporting. If we don't have things classified correctly up front, we don't know which suppliers to be looking at. If you've only got a few hundred suppliers, it's a lot easier than when you've got thousands and thousands of suppliers. I met somebody a couple of years ago from the oil and gas industry, um, one of the major oil producers, and she told me how many suppliers they had. And they were in the hundreds. And it was like, that's unbelievable. <laughs> at the time, we had thousands and thousands of suppliers. So they had a very tight grip on their um, supply chain which does help, but a lot of companies don't have that same level of control for various reasons. I'd also add the top 20 suppliers that you think are your top 20 are probably not your top 20. And the reason that I say that is most people don't normalise their suppliers the way that we do for our clients. So a lot of the time you'll get a parent-child relationship normalisation, which is no use for procurement. What you need is we've got one client who has 30 different versions of PwC. PwC, P.W.C, PricewaterhouseCoopers, lots of suffixes on the end. So they're looking at one record out of 30. They're not getting the full picture there. And that happens an awful lot. It's, you know, IBM, Dell, they're the common kind of um, uh Deloitte, you know, they're, they're the usual suspects that come up quite a lot where you generally have multiple versions of the same supplier. But And again, some of that is sitting in your tail at maybe a couple of thousand dollars because somebody set up a, an account with limited instead of LTD or something, you know. Um, so, so that's really important as well. One of the things we learned from working with Susan previously is the importance of using multiple data references so we use susan to help normalize our data but we also worked with our credit agency to cleanse our data as well so that they could do in a matter of minutes what it took us ages to do um, and it made it so much quicker and easier and you, as susan says you can rapidly compress that tail at that point but working with the credit agencies we were able to look at the familial relationships of the companies and say, well, actually, we deal with 10 different instances of this company, but they're all owned by the same parent company. From a procurement point of view, that means I can engage with the parent and say, actually, how do I get the best deal and how do I just negotiate once to cascade across all of those companies rather than wasting a lot of time 
and referrals back to group. Some of this issue, I guess, is comes from the fact that we sit across the organisation and we're reliant on other areas of the business for some of that data. So if you've got spend data, often that'll be from the, the finance, from the P2P. Contract data might be reliant on legal and performance data just sort of sits across everyone. And then the other sort of key data stream that I look at is activity data. So what is it that procurement are actually working on, which is obviously tracked in, often tracked in spreadsheets and a bit lacking there. So that's one of those things that I get, now there's, there's a greater focus on procurement, the sort of strategic importance of it. Actually, we're getting to a position where where we're getting better data in those areas. But especially the, the finance piece, the ERP, you know, you might have 10, 20, 30 years of quite bad data that needs to then be, then be cleansed. Um, Susan, what's, what would you say are the, the key steps in effectively cleansing your, your procurement data? Making it a routine and habit. Make it part of your daily job. It's kind of like, you know, I've just been to the dentist. Um, so it's like brushing your teeth every day. If you do that every day, then you're going to minimise the problems. But if you're not brushing your teeth every day, you're going to get plaque build up and then you might lose a tooth. And and data's the same, you know, or housework, you know, you don't clean your house for a month. It's going to be so much, much more work to do when you do clean it. If you're just doing a little bit every day, then you don't notice it so much. And, and data's like that, too. I think it has to be just ingrained in the culture. We have to make it less intimidating for people. Again, it's about not talking in data language, but business language making it relatable um, and getting people to understand like what, what's in it for me. Like if you're maintaining your data and you're helping make cost savings or increase profits, guess what? That could be bonus related. That could help contribute towards a pay rise or a promotion. You know, there's so much more to it than just we need to clean our data. And I think sometimes the message isn't quite right. And I'd say procurement is very much a team sport. It's across so many functions. And what we're finding, having looked at our data, is we have inputs, um, finance and IT have inputs, but we also need to work really closely with the quality team as well. And what we try to do is promote a virtuous circle. As Susan says, do it regularly, do it often, do a little bit. And you then prevent, but you also get the early warning that something might have gone astray. So you can then deal with it there and then. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, the other thing is, like, if you're looking at your data on a regular basis, you suddenly start to see when things don't look quite right. So, like, every month you're paying a supplier 5K and then one month it's 50K. It's like, OK, did somebody put an extra zero in here or did we have something special going on? Otherwise, you just wouldn't notice it. And Natasha, have you got any examples of where poor data qualities affected a procurement decision you've made? In my previous role, we spent a lot of time con consolidating the supply chain. Not having everything classified correctly meant that the problem we thought we were dealing with wasn't actually the problem, the root cause of the problem. And so you go into action trying to address problem A to discover that actually problem A is only a symptom of something much further back. And once you have the data, you can then drill down into it. As Susan says, you see the trend and you spot an anomaly. So you then go into that. In this case, it was a purchase order. You start looking at it and you go, well, actually, that's not coded correctly. It's not in the right area. Now let me drill back into it. And for us at the time, it was looking more uh, temporary labour and people being classified as coming through agencies versus people who were self-employed, versus people who worked through a limited company. And you uncovered a completely different scenario than that that you expected to uncover. I've come across this before. A long time ago, I worked at Heathrow Airport, and there was a perception around behaviours amongst passengers at the time. And actually, once we got the data and we started analysing it, we realised that the perception was completely incorrect. And actually, it was a very different behaviour from a different set of airlines at that time than everybody expected. Um, and I think that's one of the really interesting things about data, that we all have these perceptions, these urban myths. But unless you drill into the data, you can't get to the truth. That's a great example of gut versus data. 
And I think data analysts now are so important in procurement, but in business. We've just brought two analysts in with us at Harland and Wolf. Um, we're already starting to see the benefits. We're looking to use them not just in procurement, but within commercial. There is so much evidence that they can provide and help and then start to drive and inform decisions at that point. But it, it informs strategy. If you don't have the evidence, how do you know what the benefits will be of those decisions you're making at that point. It's telling those stories, isn't it? I think there are these perceptions and there's these myths. And actually, if you're able to challenge those through data, then that's that's so valuable to what procurement does. I talk a lot about soft skills and being data driven is, I think, one of the, the sort of the top 10 soft skills that, that we have in procurement and something that we need to be working on developing. Very much so. I'd say we spend a lot of time talking about negotiation, about influencing and persuading people. And data is another tool in that armory. You wouldn't go into a negotiation without knowing what you have to trade and what your margins are. Well, how can you know that if you don't have the data behind it? And the accurate data, because if your margins are wrong as well, that's going to mess things up too. Exactly. And if you don't know how much something really costs and what your overheads are, how can you then have a conversation with the supply chain about their overheads? How can you start to unpick and say, well, why are you charging that when actually your engagement in this is relatively small and we think you're just um, passing something through? Why are you making it putting a 30% markup on something that you're not adding any value to at which point the supplier might turn around and go well actually we are adding a lot of value and we take i don't know a raw material and we convert it into um goes from a lump of coal to a diamond which probably wouldn't work because (laughs) how they occur naturally but um things like that you need to be able to understand and the softer side is being able to have the conversation openly with suppliers and for them to open up the background to that there is having the data because without that data how do you draw that to the conclusion you want to get to is this something that where ai is going to have a big role in moving us forward or do you think there's a real human aspect of understanding the data and the stories behind it i think AI will expedite the processing of the data I think for a long time we will need human intervention to interpret it because very little of the data that comes to us is purely driven by non-human intervention. There's always somebody involved at some point in that chain. An AI cannot measure when we do the unexpected it can measure the expected, it can anticipate the frequency you'll do something unexpected. But we are, we're all human, we all do something that is unforeseen. And I think until AI is intelligent enough to cope with that, it's a really useful tool that will help us. But I think you need the human intervention at the moment to try and understand it, but also to predict how somebody's responding. Um, We do in negotiations, we talk a lot about body language, how people are reacting, but then we're also coached as negotiators to control your body language or, you know, you talk about the professional flinch um, when somebody comes up with, well, it's going to be this price. (laughs) And at the time, you're actually thinking, oh, that's all right. That's, I can deal with that. But we all have to, whatever people come out with, we all learn to adapt and manipulate. And yes, I, I, AI is going to be helpful in interpreting and preventing some of that. But I think it's a tool like everything. And for me, I would see AI picking up more of the manual aspect of it, trying to gather the data, trying to get it into the right format. I know Susan uses AI to try and help with some of her data cleansing, so it's probably best if Susan talks about that. We don't, actually. 
you don't. No, we are proudly AI free. Um, we, and the reason is we get data ready for use in AI. Um, we, we, we have automations, but that is based on data that we have classified. So it's, it's more, it's, I mean, you could call it AI. It's more just, um, data modeling um i i i just i get really annoyed by a lot of companies who say that the ai is classifying all our data and it's really not it's like 80 percent people um it's when it comes to specifically classification it's so subjective and contextual and the same supplier can be different classifications for different companies depending on what they do so it's you know it, you can teach the AI that, but you need a lot of work and input from humans to do that. Um, so we actually find we're quicker <clears throat> just classifying from scratch, doing it, getting it right, and then we can use the data that we created to then refresh and repeat and update, etc. But it's not to say we won't use it in the future. I think you know we're working on something where there'll be a mixture of humans and AI, but. It's about understanding the data and and understanding the output because if you blindly trust the AI and you don't know your data, how are you going to know if it's right or wrong? I was going to say, I think that's the message, isn't it? That you need the human intelligence to be able to say, yes, the data's saying, but why is it saying that? And then to track back through and go, well, actually, it was coded incorrectly. And it's being able to do that Um but it's being able to understand how it works first and foremost to find that root cause. How do we foster a data-driven culture within our procurement teams? Sort of tips around that or any challenges you've faced in, in trying to do that? For me, it's showing the power of data. Once you show the information that can be extrapolated from the data, you can then say, based on this, we can have that conversation. So the data says... We've got 50 suppliers all supplying the same thing with a range of prices from actually what's the median and then how do we get everybody to that? And then how do we drive the best outcome, the best um, value for money? And I always say value for money rather than cheapest cost. Procurement is not about the lowest cost. It's about what is the best value at that time, the best outcome with the best quality throughout the whole life cycle and understanding some of those hidden costs. Once you have the data, people then start to see and you can demonstrate the power of that data. People then start to go, oh, that's quite useful. Oh, I wonder if. And it leads to so many questions. And I think that's where humans will always have the edge on AI because we're naturally curious and we will always say, well, what if, what if, and keep on going because we always want to know a bit more. And and if you're in a department and and using it and another department isn't and they can see all the great stuff you're doing for the business, then they're like, well, I want some of that too. And you see the be- the benefits very, very quickly and it can speed things up, but also it can be modular. So a lot of the work that Susan's done for us over the years, we've used in procurement, but then used that as a baseline for other departments to then benefit from and as a methodology to use to look at data elsewhere. And then you can trace something from, for us at the moment, We'll get a plate of steel arriving that will then be cut, become a part for a ship that will then get built into the ship. And you see the life cycle of that part going all the way through. In manufacturing, we talk a lot about traceability. We talk a lot about conformance. If we don't have an accurate part number from the very outset, we can't track that all the way through its life cycle. If you look at manufacturing, there's a lot of talk about defects and how do you assure those? How do you prevent them? For that, you need to be able to go right the way, trace it back to the very beginning again and say, well, where did something go wrong during that whole life cycle? 
to figure out where a problem may or may not have occurred to then prevent anything reoccurring. What advice would you give to procurement teams that are struggling with legacy data systems and outdated data management processes? I would say try to consolidate your data. Um, Excel is our friend. Um, We all love a good spreadsheet, but set your parameters and bring in somebody who understands data first and foremost, because they will cut through the perceived differences so much faster than a non-data professional would. Um, I would say that using somebody like Susan has certainly expedited processes for me that if we tried to do it manually would have taken us years to do and she's been able to do it in a matter of months. But she's also taken us through the logic. Um, I would also say review your data little and often to try and understand it because if you look at it whole you will just panic 60,000 lines of excel are not going to make anybody very happy (laughs) whereas if you can look at small chunks you can then start to understand the logic Um, and I think things like power bi really help to interpret and present that data so that it's so much more easy to understand it's easily accessible you it's like you've been on one of my courses or read my book or something it's like that's all the advice I'd say even if you can't get a data person in like you might not need to go back more than a year you know don't look at all the data if you don't need to you know just pull what you need um, I know from many different clients that they're only really looking at the last two years because of COVID, because it skewed the numbers and their reporting and analytics so much. It's like you might as well just disregard it. So so work work smart, look at what you need, you know, and you don't have to do it all. No, no. And I think it's as well, it's about fixing the issues, isn't it? So you've got... Uh, one of the things I look at from digitization point of view is always considering the impact on people, process and data. And you've got to, anytime you make any change, especially to, to processes, but also to systems, it's like making sure that you're not making things worse. Because <laughs> if you start, I've seen lots of digitization where it's gone wrong and then suddenly you're, you're, you're just like completely destroying your data. And then that makes everything so much more challenging to get it, get it into a better place. So you've got to always be having that sort of data mindset when you're thinking right so this this process has this um, impact and this is the data that's going to be spewed out of it create a backup i actually i met i did a panel um at an event a couple of months ago in the u.s and this lady i think they lost six months or a year of data and it was irrecoverable wow like can you imagine mm. like oh, ev- all the work you've done and it's just gone and in this day and age as well, that is frightening. What I would say, data backup is so important. You said there about the impact on people and processes of data. And I think one of the key things for me is always the governance around that data, understanding where the data is derived from, which version, and then maintaining version control, but also if I change this, have I documented what I've changed so that I can then roll back? And it's applying some of those processes that are second nature in software development, in IT, to just basic business processes and saying, fundamentally, that's what it is. But also recognizing that you don't have to be 100%. Sometimes good enough is sufficient. And if it starts to give you the messages it's great to plow on and make it correct as much as you possibly can but because we're we're constantly spending money we're constantly buying things we're constantly working the data will never be perfect at any given time because it's always in flux purely by the nature of our business because actually if we stopped then that means something's gone horribly wrong at any point in time 
We spoke briefly earlier about where we're dependent on other parts of the business for our data. So a big example is usually contract data where the metadata is missing and you don't know, have we got an active contract? Or, or sometimes the contract la- landscape is just particularly complex because you might have an MSA and lots of statements of work or contract amendments or whatever. How do we better influence other parts of the business to get the data that we need into procurement? Using those soft skills you talked about actually earlier. It's really engaging with the business, showing the value that we add, but also being open and asking the business to work with us, that we're not trying to do something to them, we're trying to do things with them. And demonstrate the benefits. Again, if you go back to negotiation, you always talk about the what's in it for me. So appeal to the with me in other parts of the business. Do your stakeholder management. I start starting to sound like a procurement textbook now, um, but it is find out what somebody else's problem is and then how can the data help them. And you only do that through talking to people, to understanding what's going on in their world, what's motivating them, what's causing them pain, and how can you help? Because sometimes having a conversation, you suddenly say, well, oh, I didn't know you were having that problem. Have you tried? Or we've both got the same problem. Who have you spoken to? Who have I spoken to? Right. We all haven't spoken to this particular department. Let's go and ask them at that point. Have you found that procurement has been separate? And Or Rich, do you find that, that they don't have much of a relationship with the rest of the business? For me, I would say procurement is one of those functions that is many things to many people. There's an evolution and people often think procurement is just about buying things. And I've often said, I buy handbags and I buy shoes. I don't buy major IT systems. I don't buy major plates of steel. Um, I procure things at that point. And a lot of people don't necessarily see the distinction. There is a perception of procurement as the derogatory term is a bunch of happy shoppers. And actually, sometimes that is what people are being asked to do. Yeah, but just the admin. Mm. It's just pure pure transactional, raise a purchase order, make sure it's receipted, and then keep that going through the ERP. That is purchasing. That is not procurement. And I think... It's having the conversations and elevating it from that purely transactional. And what's your immediate problem? My immediate problem is suppliers aren't being paid because something's not been done. Well, what hasn't been done? Oh, this hasn't been receipted. Right. Well, who's responsible for receipting? What's the process? But then as you start to look into it using data, you say, well, you're paying one pound for this and one pound ten for that but you're then paying 20 pence carriage on your one pound item. So really it's costing you one pound 20, but because of the way the supplier has marketed it, you think you're getting something cheaper and actually it's costing you more or you're paying for an item up front and ignoring the cost of the maintenance. And so you have this whole conversation around the treatment of capital expenditure versus operating expenditure well, that's not my budget. Okay, well, let's bring the person whose budget it is in and let's start looking at that. And I think a lot of the time procurement can be a catalyst and we can be a facilitator. We're not often seen that way because people think we'll just go out and buy something and we are a just go and do until you start to inform and be able to provide information and say well have you thought about what about and more and more certainly over the past sort of four years actually no maybe 10 years I think there's greater collaboration between procurement and other functions I think procurement work really closely nowadays with sustainability because when we look at scope three reporting it's all based on the supply chain You look at modern slavery, you look at social value under the government um, legislation, it's always procurement that have to inform or provide the data at that point. 
it's really difficult to do that retrospectively if you don't have the building blocks in place up front. I think most businesses go through the, oh, my goodness, I've got to do. And you say, well, you would never submit your financial returns at the 11th hour. You'd be preparing all the way through. You have systems for it. So procurement, sustainability are very much the same. And it's just trying to overlay that onto your financial data so that you work with finance, you work with IT as the custodians of so many of these systems, you work with manufacturing to get all of your data from the systems, from the shop floor sometimes. So I could grant some wishes. Are there any areas of your team or anything you're procuring that you're missing data that you would like data? So any sort of categories of data that you think would be useful for you in in your role? I think from my side, it's the perennial problem of most organisations understand their immediate supply base because those are the people we talk to all the time. It's when you start digging deeper and you go, you understand their supply chain. Some aspects, if you look at um, food, FMCG, I think that's quite a mature organisation. I think there's a lot of work gone in in that industry to understanding their supply chain from pharma through to retail. I think in manufacturing, in IT, there's a lot less data there. I think it's a lot more opaque. And if I could have a magic lamp from a genie, I would love to understand more about that and make it easier. And the only way it's going to become easier, I think, is by everybody talking and asking questions and almost taking away that fear that the only reason you want to know is to try and take cost out. Yes, I do need to know because it informs the cost. Yes, if there's lots of margin upon margin and people duplicating, it would be a cost lever that we would all follow at some point. But I think it's so important to be transparent in today's culture of reporting, especially in the ESG environment. From my perspective, I don't think that it's the data's missing. It's generally there, although I do see some uh, organisations who still don't have invoice line detail or they are not collecting that at, at the point of the invoice. They're just getting one word on their invoice for like a probably like 50 items so so getting that information is important but really for me it's getting the buy-in and investment from the budget holders to actually pay to get true value from it and not just be okay with like oh well we think it's okay or yeah we've got it half classified that's fine um we I did a POC for something recently and what they had categorised in the finance groups um, in construction, not all of it was construction. And actually, if you looked at the wider data set, a lot of those suppliers were also sitting in a whole load of other areas that were outside of construction. So there's a whole load more spend going on in another area. And there was like no kind of um, communication between the construction side and the rest of the business on working together to negotiate with the supplier and you can only know that once you start looking at your data and investing in it so hopefully that proof of concept is is done enough to get them to invest in finding out more you get these like dumping grounds don't you where there's sort of process issues i don't know it might be the, the the top category everyone's like we'll just put it under that because it's, it's easier oh than... yeah drop downs <laughs> are great yeah mm. miscellaneous, oh, miscellaneous yeah. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, going into a process knowing that people are going to try and uh, find a way around it. I've seen recently a lot of un- uncategorized as a category, and it's like <laughs> that that's not a category. <laughs> and I think the thing is, people try to find a shortcut because we all want to be as efficient as we can. So it's how do we provide the shortcuts? to stop the circumnavigation, stop the, stop people. I always think it's a bit like water. Water will always find a crack, a way to get through. 
So it's how do we make it easy to do the right thing so that actually it becomes harder to do the wrong thing. And I don't think there's ever any intent to do the wrong thing. I think it's just people trying to make their lives easier. So from my perspective, it's always how can I make this easier for somebody who might not think the same way I'm thinking on this? And I'm very conscious that I'm a different generation now to a lot of the analysts that are coming through. I'll sit there and say, right, give me the PowerPoint training, give me the instructions. They're going, oh, no, I've just done it all on YouTube. It's like, oh, okay, I haven't got a clue. Or I'll go and look at ChatGPT and I'm sitting there going, right, how do I access ChatGPT? Can somebody give me the idiot's guide? Um, and it's recognising that we all have different learning styles, different thought processes. So Susan said there about a proof of concept, take your thinking, take what you're proposing and test it with other people. And don't always go to the people who are going to think the same way that you do, who are as receptive and willing as you are. Go to the person who could be a critical friend. Go to that person who could be the one that really doesn't like this, that doesn't think it's a good idea, and actually get them to test out all those think reasons against it to see, actually, is it addressing your worry beads at that point? Thank you both for joining today. It's been a really interesting conversation. Where can people find you if they want to find out more? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Susan Walsh, Classification Guru, and you can get all my different various channels of knowledge from there. And Natasha? Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn as well, so feel free to contact me or to come by the Harlan and Wolf website. Brilliant. Thanks for the conversation today. Thank you. No, I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Do like and share and subscribe to hear the next procurement conversation. 